podium this morning because I was given an impossible task. And I tried to convince everyone that some people don't need an introduction and that Mary Alexander is one of them. Because hopefully by now everyone in this room is familiar with how wonderful Mary is and all that she does for small museums. But when they told me I had to introduce, I had to introduce her anyway, I took the easy way out. I told them they all had to help me. So I emailed a large group of people and told them, send me adjectives that describe Mary Alexander. As you can imagine, the results ranged from extremely touching to fairly humorous, and I have a few of them to read. Supportive, thoughtful, intelligent, poodle lover, energetic, inspirational, opera fan, and young soul. There were many, many more, but then I got one email that blew them all out of the water. It said, there must be a word for somebody who can cause you to look inside yourself at something you've done and make you realize you need to fix it without making you feel bad or less. Darn if I can think what that single word is. It's not quite motivating or inspiring. It's the ability to make you better because she somehow gently made you know you could make you better. And if that's not Mary Alexander, I don't know what is. So I have the honor, with help from many friends, of introducing our plenary speaker, Mary Alexander. Numbers might be of interest to you for a whole bunch. 
bunch of reasons, from convincing your board that you're like other institutions, from uh, dropping these numbers perhaps into grant applications, whatever. So I thought it would be fun for you to know um, what we discovered when we sent out a survey monkey uh, right before Christmas and then followed that with a follow-up right after Christmas. So somebody tell me what I do here to make this advance. For survey monkey emails, 91 of you completed them. And I'd like to give you a sense of what we learned. And what I've done is actually take the results of the survey and pull out those elements that relate particularly to those of us in this room. Half the museums responding to our survey had three or fewer full-time staff members. So in essence, think about it, you guys are 50% of the historical and cultural museums uh, in Maryland. Most of you work with less than 100 volunteers. I like nodding heads, absolutely. I thought it would be interesting for you to realize you're in a community of folks and there are lots of you. And when I say most, I mean about 50% of our 91 respondents. And half of you welcome fewer than 5,000 visitors a year. So we're really in the state of Maryland. We are working with a community of small institutions with limited <coughs> staff resources. And I thought this was a very interesting um, question that we asked about how you communicate. And I have to say that the thing that surprised me the most, these are in descending order of your reportage. So most of you have websites, many of you use Facebook, and I thought it was really interesting that e-newsletters beat out paper newsletters. So clearly we're adopting um, the web in a way that's valuable to all of us. We asked folks to talk about their top three institutional concerns. And I pulled out the, from your um, profile what the responses were. Who is surprised that reliable funding is number one? Duh, that's not hard to know. I thought that increasing volunteers is certainly a comment or a concern that I hear as I wander the state and chat with lots of folks from the shore to uh, Frederick County. I thought it was interesting that increasing attendance was the third uh, most important concern. And I had to put in caring for collections because that came in just at number four. And I always argue with the staff of the Maryland Historical Trust that one of the most important things that our historical and cultural museums do is care for the cultural patrimony of our state. So while it didn't rank three, I felt it was important to mention that it comes in just under that uh, with frequency of response. All right, so we asked 20 questions in our survey, and I've given you a sense of the profile that I've teased out for this audience to give you a sense of who our respondents told us you were. But then we asked a series of questions about the Maryland Historical Trust office, which many of you may know, that office is standing in front of you uh, as we uh, enjoy our breakfast. So it's not a huge place, guys. Uh, Wayne Clark retired, what, five, six years ago, and I've been soldiering on virtually on my own since then. So we asked you, what have you used the most from the Maryland Historical Trust? And clearly, in the days of um, uh, grants program, funding was a large component of our offerings to you. But I was thrilled to see that our workshops scored uh, very high on, in the survey process, because many of those workshops happen right here at this uh, convening each 
each year. Uh, I consider one of the things that's part of my job description that there needs to be a Maryland Historical Trust workshop of some kind here because we have so many of you in one place uh, and it's an opportunity to have a conversation with you. we asked in the survey towards the end was not only what have you done with the Maryland Historical Trust Museum Assistance Program, but where would you like us to go? And the top uh, rankings were best practices workshops, webinars, regional workshops, and technical assistance. And it's interesting for this group of respondents that, are, that you represent, the webinars were not as highly ranked as the workshops themselves. And I actually would credit this conference with some of that, because I think we all realize that sometimes at SMA, that casual conversation over lunch or breakfast sometimes gets things going in a way that I'm afraid a webinar just doesn't meet that particular need. Um, so it was interesting that uh, that's the recommendations from the survey of what we should do. What happens now with this needs assessment process is that we'll be convening a series of follow-up conversations that we're calling focus groups to actually take the, the information we've gotten through SurveyMonkey and try and dig a little deeper into that information to discover how can we best serve the needs of various constituents within the museum community. Because clearly not all of our respondents were small museums, but virtually half of them were. And I think we've got an opportunity to serve you in ways that uh, will meet your professional growth needs. And how exciting that the American Alliance of Museums has reached out to small museums. And you can bet that we'll be talking with them about what they're up to and seeing how we can intersect our activities with them as that process uh, develops. Uh, so stay tuned. If you would like to participate in one of these focus groups in the future, uh, send me a quick email and I'd be delighted to uh, make arrangements. We'll be pulling together museums by types so that we can actually look at, we'd like to have a convening of an all-volunteer institution with perhaps some of your neighbors as well. We'd like, in other words, we want to segment our uh, responses and try and figure out just what those responses mean and how we could best serve you. The plan is that there will be actually a report to the Maryland Historical Trust Board uh, that will be written and issued probably in mid-summer that takes this information that we've gotten from this uh, process and puts it into the next steps for the Museum Assistance Program at the Maryland Historical Trust. So I thought you would be interested in seeing what we discovered um, and thank all of you who took the time to answer our 20 questions, and shame on you who didn't. We needed to hear your voices, but uh, we'll get you some other way. Uh, before I move on to the second segment of my remarks, any questions about the needs assessment from here? All right. introduce you to Leslie Vanderlee, um, I'm actually going to ask you to do something for yourselves this morning. And on each table, yes, on each table is a, we're missing a box over here, guys. So on each table is a box. And in that box it are slips of paper. And I'd like to take the next 15 minutes and ask you to 
open the box if it's closed up, look at the three slips of paper. Uh, we need another box over here, guys. Oh, I, never mind. <laughs> All right, so your task is to open the box. There should be three slips of paper in that box. Um, some of the slips of paper have a question. Some of the slips of paper have a uh, one, two, three words and then dot, dot, dot. <coughs> at your table, take some time to look at the three slips. Choose one that intrigues you. And think outside the box. <laughs> John Kennedy's comment about ask not what you can, what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. So I'd like you to think about if you're sitting with your colleagues from your own institution, talk about what could we do that would be different and exciting and challenging for our institution. If you're with strangers, and you'd like to talk about the Small Museum Association Conference and what it does and doesn't do and what it might do, that's cool. If you've got a problem at your museum and you'd like to talk about that with colleagues that aren't at your museum, that's cool. You define the universe, you have the conversation, and at the end of this process, we'll get a little bit of recordage out and in fact, it would be terrific if you have ideas that bubble up, get them to Rod Cofield, to me, to an SMA board member, so that we can follow up on this conversation. So if somebody will tell me what time it is. It's uh, 8.35, so we'll take about 12 minutes. And you ladies who are here with two, you might want to join a different table if you like. Move around, have fun. Thank you. So we, we a better way to serve volunteers, and 
Actually, I'd like Lindsay to be sure to note down in her note taking that another conversation talked about this morning was how SMA could better serve volunteers. So maybe we need to think about volunteers as a special audience of both ourselves as institutions. Uh, Lindsay, maybe a Bruin review on uh, best practices for volunteer training. I mean, uh, the sky's, the, we're out of the box today, right, guys? So the sky's the limit. So volunteers popped up. Yes, sir? Well, I'm coming back to the volunteers. I mean, we, we just thought that instead of trying to get more volunteers, we should make better use of them. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I don't care how many there are. What are they doing? Okay. And no. why, why do we need them? You know, like, what, what are we having them do? Got it. So he's talking about not just good volunteer services are not just more is not necessarily better, but how are you using your volunteers? Um, what are they tasked to do? Um, are they happy? How do you reward them? How do you get rid of the ones that make you crazy? Um, all of those things. Um, and I love the notion of SMA doing something particularly for volunteers, because if we think about how this organization has evolved, we really began back there 30 years ago with a whole lot more volunteer folks here that are in this room today. Uh, um, um, your name is falling right out of my head. Melissa. Uh, when we, Steve and I first came out for breakfast, some of our colleagues were talking about how to get rid of some of all that junk that you're given, the bag, the bag that's left on your front door. And this brought up the fact that Maryland has no abandoned property laws that deal directly with museums. And we need them desperately because great aunt Sarah's wedding dress that she wore in Idaho, never saw Maryland at all, really doesn't belong in Baltimore County. And it's a very important topic. A lot of states have put together abandoned property laws, and there's an entire website on it, and I think it's something that we need to move forward on as an institution. Great. Um, I'm just repeating so that people understand what we're doing that, because I know I sat all the way over there the other day, and when people turned their heads, I couldn't hear a word. So Melissa's talking about two elements of our collections. One is that box of junk that ends up on the front steps, and you don't know where it's from, you don't know a thing about it, or maybe you know a little bit about it, because somebody walked in and said, here, this was in Great Aunt Minnie's attic. And the other is the whole issue of the abandoned property legislation. And I believe that 15 years ago, the Maryland Association of History Museums began to do a project on that. It was in the days of Karen Gosnell. I don't know where it is today, but you know, there's a little team of um, mayhem folks who are particularly concerned about collections, and we may want to talk about a way that mayhem might address some of the collections issues. Pam, you want to add to that? So once again, Pam's reinforcing the whole issue that the abandoned property legislation needs to be looked at. Rob? <laughs> so a whole discussion in that, actually, as I was wandering around pretending to be a teacher, uh, board issues were bubbling up here and there of who are these people that call themselves the board of our institution? What do they do? What do they think they are supposed to do? What do they do? And what can we do about them? And one group talked about what can we do to actually bring board, new board members in who are not as old and creaky as I am, but are more, are younger and more energetic than I am? Back, maybe. <laughs> um, okay, anything else that bubbled up that you want to get into or yes ma'am.
this particular table has people from, from California, from Missouri, from Connecticut, all, all around, right? And the problems that people either have with school tours or the lack of school tours or solutions for things. We have somebody who does um, smartphone apps for, for virtual tours and how you get you know, that involved, made for a really out-of-the-box discussion on either how to address issues or what could we do more or how could we get, you know, people involved. And of course, there's not enough time to, to get things resolved, but the ideas that everybody shared and the concerns everybody shared, I think, makes all of us go away with more things to think about. And do we want to have two parts, a session about school tours, or do we want to have um, like an unconference session that reflects on this kind of a process? So the conversation at this table was about school tours, and it strikes me that what's being asked about or suggested is session session discussions about school tours. We heard about Common Core, we heard about standards of learning, da da da. But I think that Cassie also seems to be suggesting that perhaps one of the round tables next year is a less structured conversation about school requirements, effective strategies, catastrophes, and what the lessons are. Uh, and what's lovely about that table back there, guys, is that few of those people are from Maryland. So they it blew open this stupid Maryland box and talked about the East Coast region, and did I hear California was there? Or whatever. So, um, uh, so I, I realized as I was yammering away today that I have to be a little careful about all this Maryland junk because there are other states here that uh, you know are not so uh, involved in the Maryland Historical Trust and the programs that we try to do. But is, yes, back there. Do, is there any kind of monthly forum where people just all get on a conference call and hash out one idea? Like, I could see continuing this discussion on a monthly call, and it could be a different theme every month, but maybe you're already doing something like that? Did you hear that, guys? A uh, uh, monthly <coughs> connect up uh, about uh, maybe a topic? Yeah, one topic. Uh, a, a topic. Uh, a way to connect. I mean, I hate all those things that are not people-to-people -people conversations, but I'm weird and old. So I think there are lots of people here who love to do the Facebook, whatever you do on Facebook, and do all that stuff. <laughs> think about it. Lindsay? Um, not to plug an organization I'm not a part of, but the Mid-Atlantic Association of Museums is doing just that. The Mid-Atlantic Association of Museums some people might be aware that they exist and kind of wonder what they're doing. We had a talk with them when we were looking at what Mayhem was doing, and that's one thing that they have been focusing on, having, I think, monthly or maybe quarterly conference calls all over the region about one topic at lunchtime. So okay. you might want to Mid -Atlantic. If I can say that louder so everybody can get it, the Mid-Atlantic Association of Museums, which is one of the six American Association of Museums regional organizations, is doing a kind of link up. Uh, I assume that you can Google Mid-Atlantic Association of Museums, discover what they're doing. Uh, I think it's an interesting thing to get the SMA board perhaps to think about that are there ways that with our incredibly interconnectivity we can do um, in, a, in an ongoing way to continue the conversation. Thanks, guys, for bearing with me and thinking outside the box. This is Leslie Vanderlyn. She was the at the uh, DC Trolley Museum, he gave me 
two boxes of Leslie's records. And I have to tell you, it was a delight to get a peek into another person's uh, career. Uh, and those files will go to the Maryland Historical Society, to the Montgomery County Historical Society. And there are only a few objects in there that relate to the Small Museum Association, actually. But we've agreed that we'll copy some of those files that relate to SMA for the SMA records, um, too. Leslie had a bachelor's degree in Persian history from the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. She was one of the early um, museum education graduate program graduates of George Washington University. She came to Maryland as the director of the Sandy Spring Museum. Some of you may have met Allison yesterday, who's a, a successor to Leslie. And she was the director of the Montgomery County Historical Society when I met her, I think, in 1988. And in the course of looking at Leslie's records, I came across this, I came across wonderful lectures and notes that she'd taken, and I came across this wonderful quote about her perception of museums, and I believe the date is 1992. So you can see that this is a lady that was quite a forward thinker, which is the inspiration for Outside the Box today. She was able to see challenges and think about them in ways that perhaps others hadn't. When I met Leslie Vanderlee uh, in the late 1980s, uh, we had a conversation that makes me laugh today. Because I was talking with her, I was very involved in the uh, Mid-Atlantic Association of Museums leadership. And I was talking to Leslie, and she told me, quote, I'm going to the beach with the old ladies. <laughs> and I had no idea what she was talking about. But she then explained to me that she and a group of others, and you met some of the early SMA folks last night, um, she and others looked at the offerings of the American Association for State and Local History, the Mid-Atlantic Association of Museums, and or say AM, and figured out that they didn't care about or meet the needs of organizations run by volunteers or very small museums. So that this conference began, and it was interesting to hear Mike Dyson tell us that actually the 1984 conference was in the summer. Um, so things have changed. Um, so Leslie would, was very committed to small museums, very committed to helping small museums, and very active in the Small Museum Association. Um, and I, if it's really fun, here's Leslie's program from the 1994 uh, SMA conference, complete with a very carefully typed out program it's hilarious. <laughs> and this will go to SMA so that it's part of their records if they don't have it. Here she is, here she is again. Um, one of the things that Leslie did was she was part of something called Leadership Montgomery in Montgomery County. And she got to know lots of politicos across the county. And she convinced, I'm not sure whether she convinced or the county exec asked if she could help create a county history museum. And so she created maybe, and is Liz Chateau here, maybe the first um, history museum consortium in Montgomery County. Uh, and its goal 
in the early 1990s was to create a county history museum with county government support. And so Leslie used her um, contacts from Leadership Montgomery to reach out to the county politicos and help to get um, the county-wide look at history in Montgomery County. Because I think in the old days, um, the Montgomery County Historical Society was very focused in uh, Rockville and not very in inclusive of other county organizations. She also, when I met her, she also got involved in something called the called Mad Cap, the Museum Artifact Documentation and Collections Accessibility Program. The Museum Artifact Documentation and Collections Accessibility Program. She convinced the developer in Silver Spring to give the Montgomery County Historical Society computer support on the ground level of a new office building. And Harriet Stout's around here somewhere. And she has a photograph of that um, Mad Cap training program in 1992. So Leslie was, back in the old days before we even knew what the terms past perfect meant, she was involved in trying to figure out how to document collections. Liz Chateau also tells me that she was a part of a retreat for the Frederick County Historic Sites Consortium Group in the early 90s, mid 90s, something like that. Um, so this is a lady who, uh, she didn't even know what boxes were, never mind uh, how to think outside them. She was outside them all the time. And the last piece I want to talk about is that Leslie, well, this is, a, this is a cartoon that I found in Leslie's files. And I think, can you read it all the way in the back, guys? I love it. I love it. And I, when I found that, I said to myself, this is for SMA. <laughs> this is to help you appreciate uh, what this lady was. The last piece I want to talk about is that Leslie was involved, actually, in the creation of the Maryland Historical Trust Museum Assistance Program in 1991. And she was involved with another group of folks in Baltimore, most of them are gone, I think, in the sense of not in Maryland any longer. John Valiant is around, but not involved in museums so much anymore. John Valiant, Dennis Zimbala from the Baltimore Museum of Industry, John Ott from the b and Railroad Museum, Leslie Vanderlee from Montgomery County Historical Society, and Leslie would take one of her docents, dressed as Mrs. Beale, Mrs. Bell from the Bell Dawson House, down to the legislature to convince them to fund the Maryland Historical Trust for a fund for a grant funding program for historical and cultural museums. So, and she was a member of the first peer review panel for the Maryland Historical Trust Museum Assistance Program in 1990. So this is a lady who didn't take no for an answer, who thought, as I say, she practically didn't know boxes even existed, and she was a truly magical thinker, and I think that I love the fact that this organization, 30 years later, is rolling right along, um, trying to do good work for the folks that work in small museums, particularly those with volunteers really in charge in so many ways. But before we put a halo on Leslie, I think we also, might, that is not the end, that's the end. We'll leave that. We also might want to have a little sense of her as a human being. And in the course of reading her files, 
I found a nine-page letter to the chairman of the board of the Sandy Spring Museum, basically telling him, leave me alone. <laughs> Let me do my job. And I thought that to end my remarks about Leslie, it might be helpful for us since we all are humans and we trip and we make mistakes and we misjudge things, that it might be interesting to see a little bit of that, that side of Leslie rather than this halo that I've tried to paint for you today. So I'm going to pull, and I asked her husband if I could do this, and he said yes. I'm going to pull a couple of sentences from her nine-page letter to the chairman of the board arguing, leave me alone, let me do my job. This is, these are Leslie's words. I have been accused of trying to turn the Sandy Spring Museum into the Smithsonian. Insofar as this means adhering to basic methods of operation, I guess I am. I have heard people say, yes, we're a county museum. I'm sorry, but there is no such thing. That's like saying, I'm a country doctor, therefore I don't have to use antibiotics or state-of-the-art medical practices. As a community museum, we can hope to be more in tune with the needs of our constituents, but cannot compromise basic standards. Thank you. 